appreciate it. Uh, we wanted to just kind of get to know you a little better and share with people uh, that follow my channel and watch YouTube and watch you a little bit about you that they might be curious about. Sure. And so, thanks uh, for having me. Absolutely. Hello, everybody. <laughs> So I wanted to just start by asking, how did you get started in West Coast Swing? So West Coast Swing, I didn't like West Coast Swing when I started West Coast Swing. So I was a professional Lindy Hopper, and I loved a dance called Carolina Shag. And in order to learn more techniques and uh, more things I could integrate into Carolina Shag when I lived in Los Angeles, I had to learn West Coast because that was the closest dance that I could possibly get to it. So I'd go back to Myrtle Beach and I would learn from all the shaggers there. And I, I was actually, I was talking to someone this weekend about this. Uh, this is before YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. So I paid this guy five bucks a month who lived in Myrtle Beach and he would mail me VHS copies of Carolina Shag videotapes um, every month. And I would like pour over those with my friends and we'd watch them and try and learn Shag. Um, and then I started going at West Coast Dancing in order to, yeah, to get better at Shag. And then I saw a flyer for an event uh, called Swing Diego. It was the first year of Swing Diego. And I saw that the prize money was like $50,000 or something. And I didn't understand at the time that it was distributed among all the divisions. And I was like, I can learn West Coast. I'll, I'll make 50 grand. It's, that's worth it, you know? Uh, and then my first event for West Coast was, it was called Boogie and Blues. It's, the event doesn't work anymore. But my buddy Dax and I, uh, pro Lindy Hopper, is going to this event. We're like, we walk into this ballroom in Long Beach, California. We're like, who are the best two followers? We're going to teach these people a thing or two about technique. You know, we thought we were the best thing ever. And uh, they point out this this little short woman over there and this young girl. And we went up fearlessly and danced with Tati on the moment and Marianne Nunez. We're like, okay, this is a cool dance. We see what they're doing. Um, and that became, that was like my love affair with West Coast started August of 2000, really. Uh, 2000, 2001 was my first, my first year in West Coast. So I was Lindy Hopper, uh, I started teaching in 1998 when I lived in Florence, Italy. And then I uh, started Shag in 99 and then West Coast in 2000. Wow, going all the way back. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, did you have any particular idols in West Coast Swing that you really followed or? Uh, when I started, I always loved the social awesomeness of Kyle and Sarah. Um, and when I was starting out, uh, I was on the Lindy Hop tour. So I was going to Lindy Hop conventions and traveling to teach workshops. Like here in Denver, my first Lindy Hop workshops were at the Turn Um And the weekend that I was teaching there, Kyle and Sarah were in town teaching West Coast workshops somewhere. And for the first like three months, every weekend, I was in the same city as Kyle and Sarah. It was pretty cool. And I would teach, you know, the Lindy Hop stuff. I'd do Lindy Hop dances on Sunday night. I would always go to the West Coast dance in whatever city I was in. And then I would get to play with all the, you know, all the Westies. Nice. So, yeah, Collins there were huge influences. Uh, Ginger Pickerel, who I got to dance with this weekend. She was one of my first shag teachers. Um, and then we started putting a routine together. I never got on the floor, but she was so amazing to work with. And I always look up to her for her full work. Um, and her responsiveness is amazing. Awesome. So, um... How did you do in rising through the ranks? Did you do like everybody else? Start in novice, go, you know, yeah, all the way I started in novice. I never, I never just jumped right somewhere, but when I was dancing through the levels, the point system was totally different. I don't really understand it now because I don't have to. Um, but I was in novice for about 10 months, uh, from Boogie and Blues all the way through something called St. Patrick's Day Swing, I think, that was in LA. And then I won Seattle Easter Swing and Intermediate. And I think I just did one more after that, but I went right to Advanced. Uh, Jordan and Todd were coaching me back in the day, and and, uh, and they said, there's no rush, you know, like don't, you don't have to get out of a, of a division, make sure they throw you out. And I didn't quite understand what that meant, and I do now, because, you know, when, you, when you're at an event in the Champions Division, everyone's fighting for those 10 spots and everyone belongs there, you know? So it's a matter of the lower you are, enjoy the process because when you get to All-Star, if you get to Champions, you, making finals is no longer like a, you know, that easy if it was easy earlier on for you. Gotcha. But wow. I, I, put in, I put in some good months in Novice and in advance for a bit and then they created the All-Star Division and so I was in the All-Star Division with my my graduating class, so Edwin Lee, Nathan, uh, Nathan Warner, Miles and Tessa, like, we all came up at the same time. Cool. So, uh, as a champion, uh, 
basically, what does it take to be a champion? I mean, besides once well, you get to All-Star. So there's competitive level, which just means you've put in the time, you've, you've, you've worked so many hours on your craft that you can replicate whatever you want to do at a moment's notice. Um, you have your grounded, you know, dance. You have your responsiveness. You have your engagement and disengagement in the dance, um, and you can replicate it. And you can make other people look that good when you dance with them. So to me, that's all about what makes part of a champion a champion. Um, and then, as being like a champion traveling instructor, even though I'm trying to do that less now. Um, to me, the difference between a champion traveling instructor and a regional instructor is that not only do I continue my education and take from everybody, but I've created my own techniques and philosophies and I've borrowed from all the other pros and even non-pros, I learned from everybody. I learned from watching my puppy. And I'm like, oh, that's how that works. You're really cute. Um, and creating your own stuff, your own platform, and then having enough pride in it to dance that platform and say, this is how I dance, I'm gonna teach how I dance, and I'll show you other ways of dancing too but I'm proud of, of what I have to offer in the dance. And I have to remember that when I'm competing because I watch my peers and I go, oh, I would love to dance like that, or I'd love to dance like that. And then I go, oh, I'll train that. But when I'm dancing, I dance me. Cool. Yeah, me too. So as far as becoming a champion, do other champions have to like vote you in? Do you have to be an all-star for a certain length of time? Is it you know, I really don't know how it works. Um, because it's not like a, it's a title that you have to sort of project and then maintain. It's like saying, why does Pepsi or Coke, why do they keep advertising? Because if they didn't have their billboard up or they didn't have the commercial, someone else would, and then you'd have more attention on that. So um, there, there, there used to be an event called the 4th of July Phoenix mm -hmm. uh, Champion of Champions division. So the division, I don't know if they still do this, um, but every year if you got a vote from your peer group, then you'd get a ballot. And then, so I was always overjoyed. Like I'd get a ballot and I'd go, at least one follower in the champions level says that I should be in there dancing with her. And then um, I would vote for, I think you could vote for like up to 10 followers. And I was very proud that I didn't pick the champions that, like, in the champions group, it's just like a normal group of friends. You're not friends with everyone. Like I don't know half the champions. Like we don't like get together and chat. I hang out with my friends, you know. Um, so with with the voting system for that year, it was, it was always cool to get a vote, and then I would always put in who the followers I thought belonged there, not the followers that would probably end up there, right? Because like. Jordan and Todd, they travel all the time. I don't socially see them. I, I dance with Todd when, you know, if I see her. But I wouldn't, I didn't vote for Todd because I wanted to dance with Sarah Breck and Kristen Sorcy and, um, you know, and anyone else. And I was like, man, I grew with Lindy Greer. I want to dance with these people. Mm -hmm. I want to vote these people in. So nowadays, I don't think there's a way to get to the champions level unless, um, Dancing routine is a great way to do that. So you start in Rising Star, uh, which wasn't around when I started. I just went right into Showcase because I was a pro Lindy Hopper dancing Showcase. But um, yeah, dancing routine is a great way to get noticed. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's, and to me also part of what makes a champion a champion is that you can evolve the dance the way you see fit. So if I say, here's a technique and I use it and everyone starts using it, then I've changed and progressed the dance for what I see as the better. Cool. So uh, being a champion really requires some travel, right? I mean, you... It does, it so. does. You have, to, you have to hit the ground running. Um, I've been on the road between 30 and 40 weekends a year since 2001. And it's freaking tiring. So I just, I got into a semi-retired stage in, um, when was it? I came back from my journey in August and I decided I still want to teach, I still love it, I love social dancing again. You know, we all hit our plateaus or you know, we're not feeling it sometimes, but I, right now I'm feeling it. Um, so at home I have a studio in Gresham, Oregon and I teach Tuesdays and Wednesdays and I work with other competitors, people who come in like on demand. So if you came in on a Friday, I'd work with you on a Friday. You know? But otherwise, 
I'm just working on enjoying life. And I travel once or twice a month. Um, but yeah, you, you got to get out there. And, and what we don't, what we don't see, we don't really see people for people, right? You see, you see somebody like, oh, that's a champion dancer. But you don't know, is that an extroverted person? Is that an introverted person? Do they want to be on stage? Right. Are they, can they create their art through masks? You know, they're dancing a piece, but maybe they can't have a conversation because they don't want this interaction, you know? Sometimes I'm in the ballroom and I want to dance with everyone, and then I just have to go hide for a little bit and play with my puppy, and I go, okay, now I can come back and dance with everyone. Um, because you want to give and give and give. Speaking of which, I mean, you become a sort of celebrity by being a champion, yeah. by being on YouTube. So when you visit another, when you visit anywhere where there's a dance going on, do you pretty much have anonymity until you get to the hotel, and then it's like people pointing or wanting to talk to you, or how does that work? Before the, I guess, well, occasionally you meet people in the airport. Okay. Like you see people all the yeah. time. Like someone's like, "Hey, Doug," and you're like, "Oh," or most of the time people call out Lindsay's name you yeah. know, if they see her. But um, that's one of the, the hardest things that I learned was like, if I'm really tired and I don't feel like dancing, just because you're coming up to say hi to me doesn't mean that you're going to ask me to dance or that you want to dance with me. You're just coming up to say hi. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got that through my head of like. No, people are just interacting. This is normal human interaction. Then I feel really comfortable opening up and talking to everyone. Um, and then I have my ballroom time. I'm like, I'm social dancing. Whoever wants to dance, I'm in. And then I have my super creative time when I'm like, well, in order for me to grow as a dancer, I need to be challenged. So that's when I want to dance with the people that will challenge me. Just like uh, people ask me to dance and they say, oh, I need to dance with more people like you because I challenge them. I'm like, yeah. You sure do. So do I. So we all are looking for that personal growth and development. Um, so when when you're like, it, it's our community is amazing because in what other world? If you go to Comic Con and you see Ben Affleck as Batman, you're not going to go chat with him. You know, you're not going to get to like, you know, well, dance with him. You're not going to dance with Ben Affleck. You know, <laughs> um, but at these events, you can approach. You know. Um, PJ and Tashima, you can talk to them, you can dance with them, and you can and you can learn more about them because they're giving open champion people. You know. Cool. So, bless you, puppy. Guessing that West Coast Swing is your favorite dance, and if it's not, you know what is or what's your like top three favorite dances? Sure. Well, okay. So, when you say favorite, it, it depends on a lot of factors. Like, in terms of, you can dance. West Coast to a variety of music, and dance Lindy Hop to a variety of music, Shaq to a variety of music, Salsa to a variety of music. Um, so I wouldn't say that West Coast is my favorite dance. I take elements of all the dances that I love, Lindy Hop, Shag, uh, Balboa, West Coast, Salsa, and I integrate all these techniques, uh, and then I just want to freely express myself to the music. So if I go to a West Coast swing dance, I have to escape the the, the pitfalls of this is West Coast, you have to do this. And when I go to salsa, I, I, I put on other people that they feel, I, I feel that they feel like I should dance salsa. Even though what I want to do is have a salsa bass, but experiment with movement. So my favorite music is I would dance nonstop to soul and Motown music. That's, that's, where, that's where this lives. So um, if it's a faster song, I'll drop more into like a bent knee stance and do a little more Lindy Hop bass. Um, or if it's smoother, I'll go more shag, or if it's, you know, I'll, but I, predominantly I will go, I gravitate towards West Coast, and my favorite followers are ones that have cross-training. So, uh, for example, Sarah Breck, like if, if you're watching this interview, and if you don't know who Sarah Breck is, uh, she's married to my best friend Dax, uh, she was my partner in Showcase for, for a few years, um, and to me she has one of the most amazing connections, because she can feel the Lindy side, the West Coast side, the shag side, um, and then that, that's, those are the types of people that I can express every element of my dance with without thinking about it. So, on uh, the subject of uh, your work, you are a full-time dancer, instructor, judge, etc. Yes. Um, you also do some video production, do you? Yeah, so I started my video company, Doug Productions, LLC, in 2001. 
So before I was in the dance world full time, I had a job, uh, there's a company called Weber Shandwick Worldwide, which is the world's largest PR firm. So I graduated college at a liberal arts, art history degree out of a college called Bowdoin, which is in Southern Maine. And I graduated, I was teaching on the side for, for extra money just to take more lessons. And I moved back to Los Angeles where I'm from, and I'm working in high tech public relations and I hate it. And I won um, the American Lindy Hop Championships Strictly Lindy Division uh, in 2001 which was a huge, like, it's like winning the U.S. Open. So the next day, I got phone calls. Hey, Doug, you've won something. Literally, it was, since you won that, we'd like to invite you to come teach, because people will now come listen to you. I was like, oh. So I gave my two weeks notice at my job, and it was a solid two full years that I would watch a lot of TV. Like, I didn't really do much. I traveled a little bit. I had a few private lesson students. I was teaching out of a, a ballroom studio in Santa Monica called The Dance Doctor. And then a studio that you, you've all seen on uh, So You Think You Can Dance called Third Street Dance. And then I had a small little dance floor that my buddy and I built, and then my dad built me a better one. Um, in my first apartment, I do private lessons like in the corner. Like, I'd move the kitchen table, it was like weight bench, and then kitchen table, and I'd move in and teach privates there. Hmm. Um, if you weren't dancing, if you weren't a full time dancer, was there any other profession that you really were interested in pursuing? Oh, that's right, sorry, the original question was yeah. production company. I sort of went off on a no tangent way. there. Um, I love production, but I love production for my own passion projects. So on YouTube, if you've seen, you know, Lurking Lizzie videos like Let It Rain with Leafy and Tess, our new video that's coming out in a few weeks is called Trapped, uh, which is okay. beautiful. It's a totally different genre. Um, but if I, if I had to do something for financial benefit, uh, I love graphic design. I love playing in Photoshop. Um, I love creating products from scratch. So like back when I made VHS and DVDs, I love the filming process, the post-production process, anything. I've always been fortunate in terms of, I always value education. So, and group settings are not always the best for me. So when I want to learn guitar, I take private guitar lessons as a kid. I played bridge, I went bowling. My parents were like, okay, you want to take tennis lessons? You want to play tennis? You're going to Andre Agassi's camp. You want to, you know, you want to learn to play bridge, you're going to the bridge center, you're going to learn to do this, you're going to do it right. So um, with Photoshop, I went to Pete Green. I was like, all right, Pete, he's a champion of the West Coast Swing World, the New World. And he gave me private coaching and he taught me how to do all this stuff. And then I would supplement that with, you know, online lessons and whatever I could find. So I love creating a full package from, from the ground up. Um, but luckily now that I'm semi-retired, I can still have my passion art projects in terms of, of dance videos. I can still travel and play with this puppy. And, and now I'm spending a lot of time snowboarding and reading and target shooting and writing my ATV around. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, speaking of Lizzie, if anybody follows you, they know about Lizzie. Uh, can you tell us about Lizzie? I mean, sure. Well, Lizzie, so my late wife, Nikki, uh, she got her at a, uh, a pet store in the Vancouver, Washington mall. And uh, Nikki had freckles on her face and on her knees. And Lizzie has freckles on her face and her knees. So that was love at first sight. And then, so I met Lizzie when she was three. I came my dad when she was three. She's nine years now, nine years young. And uh, she travels everywhere with me. So she has her little bag and she goes under the seat in front of me on airplanes. She's very yeah. quiet. Um, if you ever knock on my door, ring my bell, she'll go ballistic. Like she wants you to know there's someone there. <laughs> but until that happens, she's just a chill she, puppy. She likes her own private space at times and then she'll cuddle. And, yeah. Yeah. So if you come up to me at an event and you want to say hi to Lizzie, just don't let her lick you because I'm training her not to lick people. <laughs> Um. Oh, and so, yeah, so Lizzie, uh, the name is short for Miss Elizabeth Bennett. So oh. Nikki was a Pride and Prejudice Jane Austen fan. So that's where she got her name from. Oh, cool. And, uh, yeah. So, I'm a novice dancer. Uh, my friend Victoria here is a uh, beginner. Uh, oh, then uh, I really shouldn't be talking to you guys. <laughs> I have to be seen amongst other pros. <laughs> uh, what, would, what kind of advice or recommendations can you give to us? Um, we're just really in love with the dance and really want to progress. And in general, just how how, how should we? How should in we general, um, got to work on it, right? So there's um, there's a book that it, it's a very famous book 
um, by Malcolm Gladwell called The Outliers, if you've heard of it. But um, Malcolm Gladwell does social, social engineering. He shows you how social realms work, how people succeed, how the best people get to where they are. And the, the short of it is 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours of work. So it doesn't mean that if you love West Coast and you go social dancing for 10,000 hours, right? So what is that like? Five days a week, eight hours a day. Then you'll be Benji Schwimmer. You'll be the best, right? Like you can do anything that you want to do because you've put in those 10,000 hours. Um, so the 10,000 hours that you have to do are the training, the standing in the studio on one leg going, where's my balance? And where's my balance on this part of my foot? Where's my balance on this part of my foot? If I'm transferring my weight to this foot, how fast am I doing it? Can I do it faster? Can I do it slower? How do I make sure that I'm not gonna wobble as I do that? Um, this lead that I was taught by this instructor doesn't work, so how am I gonna change it to make sure that it works socially? You know, and then you, uh, some of the best things you can do are videotape yourself, because you might say, and I get this in every private lesson, I say, oh, you know, you're stepping to your side on your whip. As a leader on your one, you should be moving backwards to allow the follower to come forwards. And one goes, oh yeah, yeah, well I was taught that, I do that. And then you watch a video, and video doesn't lie, right? So you can see right where you're stepping. Um, and then there's something that's, this is sort of a, I don't know if it's different advice than what most people would give, but in my opinion, dance competition, it, it's a totally different animal. So if you, it can really kill the love for dance for a lot of people. Because when you put yourself out on a pedestal, you can be beaten down so hard, right? Because at any event, there's 10 to 15 people making finals, and everyone wants to make finals. And if you're a novice, you want to be an intermediate. If you're an intermediate, you want to be an advanced. There's no like light at the end of the tunnel. Because some people say, oh, I just want to get to advanced, and I'll be good. You get to advanced, you're like, well, I want to be an all-stars, and I want to be more and more and more. But putting in the actual 10,000 hours of work um, on your craft is, yeah. The and just don't let it ruin your love for the dance. So for me, I at the end I used to work 11 months a year and go to Thailand on vacation for a month and just zen out. And it would take me a good two weeks to not feel my phone vibrating on my hip even though I didn't have my cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a matter of pacing and really going after it, working hard. Um, so you are the founder of the Silton Foundation, right? Yes. Uh, the Silton Foundation is a nonprofit organization. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is, what it does, how would you start that? Sure. So um, when I met Nikki, Nikki uh, was a country girl in Oregon, and, and she, she was working like five jobs. Like she was a Spanish teacher, you know, ESL through AP Spanish by day. Um, at night, she was bartending or waitressing or line dance instructing. Or, you know, she did everything just to like make ends meet. And she didn't have money for private lessons. So, um, and she'd be borrowing gas money and getting rides to different conventions. And I came from the opposite end of the spectrum. It was, you want, you want to do this well, well, let's get you lessons done. Or, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it right. I don't, I don't half-ass pretty much anything that I do. Um, so when Nikki and I met, we decided that we can, we can put money to a good use. Because for me, every year, I would take $1,000 and I would throw myself a birthday party. So in Los Angeles, it was, here's live music, here's a venue, come and dance, there's no charge. I wanna share my birthday with everyone. And I just flipped the bill for it. And then we started the foundation by taking that money and saying, we're gonna give this to people who don't have the means for dance education or anything that falls under that umbrella. And then over the last few years, we've been getting more and more donations. Um, so last year, we gave away over 12 grand and it was, the money doesn't go to the dancer, the money goes to the vendor. Meaning, uh, and you can find out all this information at the siltonfoundation.org, but uh, our winners get event passes and then, that are donated by events. And then let's say um, Gabe Topol. So Gabe Topol is here this year, he, uh, military just came back from Afghanistan and he's using his monies. Um, the foundation pays Tony Larissa. He's taking three hours with them this weekend we pay Tony and Larissa. He needs new dance shoes, we pay the vendor. Um, so the money doesn't go to the person with no money because they might use it for something that's not intended for. Right. Yeah. Cool, that's So cool. we make sure that the money stays in the dance community. And then uh, we have a, 
a list of who is approved. So not every instructor, we, we don't give money to every instructor or every event. Um, they have to be on our good person list. Cool. So aside from the whole dance world, what are your, what, what do you like to do for fun? What are your interests? What are your hobbies? Sure. Like so, I mean, if you look at my normal daily routine, <laughs> things I love. So I wake up and I cuddle with my puppy for a little bit. Um, I make myself, I love coffee. I absolutely love coffee. I'm an espresso maker and a cake cup maker. And, and uh, I'll grab coffee and I sit in my hot tub and look at my view. So I have a beautiful view. So I do that every morning. Um, I'm a big massage fan, so I get body work done once a week and I have a massage chair at home that I sit in a lot. And then for my active hobbies, uh, well, inactive hobbies, I read a lot. So um, I love like sitting in my hammock and reading or sitting by, I have my fireplace on all the time in Oregon, even if it's summer. So I sit by the fire and I read. Um, I'm learning to play the drums now, which is so mentally challenging. Um, I, I used to play guitar and piano and I was horrible at both. Drumming is very relaxing, but very mentally thought-provoking at the same time. Um, in Oregon, I am now an hour and 15 minutes door-to-door -door from some of the best snowboarding. So I go snowboarding in the winter at least once a week, and I only go weekdays because I hate crowds. I hate crowds. And then um, on the river, I go kayaking, and I float the river in Oregon. Yeah. Nice. Oh, and then I'm a huge disc golf player. So if you don't know what disc golf is, it's like frisbee golf, but we use different like weights and sizes of discs. And on my, so I have 29 acres in Oregon. So on the, I have nine acres of flat horse pasture, and I have a professional disc golf course built onto the onto the pasture. So I have my own disc golf course. I have a zip line that goes from the first hole to the second hole. Um, and then I have a hiking trail and ATV trails that go down 20 acres. Um, I'm building a cabin down there and I have a shooting range down there as well. Sweet. So it's a very self-contained, uh, yeah, a lot of acreage with a lot of room to play. That's very nice. Well, we're getting close to the end of our list of stuff to talk about here that I came uh, for you. And I would like to ask you, having danced uh, West Coast Swing, so many years as a champion now. Um, do you have any observations about how the dance has evolved, where it's at now, and where it might be going? Yeah, I think this is a really exciting time. Like, there's, there's a huge amount of change that is we're right in the middle of. So, um, there's... I feel that the champions, one of the best things about being a champion dancer is that I have the ability to show my opinion and I can progress the dance how I see fit. I'm a very progressive person. So I came into Lindy Hop and I I made I wanted to make Lindy Hop smoother and I wanted to dance to the music that I love, which was groove music, Motown music, soul music. Um, so I was able to sort of shape the dance that way. And West Coast Swing, there's a lot more modernization happening in the dance. So if you look at the dance, when I came in in 2000 or before that, you watch old videos on YouTube, in the 80s, 90s, um, you can see the progression from how, how West Coast came out of Lindy Hop and how we're refining these techniques. And we're all, all the instructors that, that are coming up or that are already here, they have their own thoughts of how this art form should be. So we all get to form it in different ways. It's really cool to see how that all, that all happens. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing where the dance will be in 10 years. Like, I'm really looking forward to, it's gonna be drastically different. I've no, I mean, no one knows what it's gonna look like, otherwise we'd be doing it already. But every time, you know, back when I started, it was Shag was a huge influence in West Coast. Um, and now it's Zook and Kazumba, and everyone's adding all these different things. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is that it follows pop music. So we'll never lose a genre of music. So West Coast Swing, if you think of it as being danced to blues music, um, it will always have a blues genre. And then there's hip hop, and then there's contemporary, and then there's slow, and there's medium, there's fast, and uh, swing rhythm or non-swing rhythm. So whatever musical artists will be producing in the future, we're gonna dance to them. And whether that means we're still in a slot, or we still have an anchor and a post, who knows? Oh, interesting. Well, Doug, thanks very much. Appreciate you taking some time out here at 5280 Westival in Denver to sit and talk and look forward to seeing more of you. We were glad you came to Denver. 
I guess it was about a month ago when yeah. uh, Jonathan Pritchard brought you in, and that was a great little weekend. Hopefully, you're open to doing that again. Yeah, and I'll be back for swing time in July. Okay. So I'm coming in for that. Looking forward to that. Um, and for all of you out there who are listening to this, you can come visit me in Oregon. Um, just half an hour east of Portland International Airport. You can find me online at DougSilton.com. And uh, for those of you who are looking for, like, to emulate, so uh, for, for dance shoes, um, I'm wearing today one of my favorite pairs, which are True Religion, uh, which I just added suede to the bottoms of. And of course, I stepped in gum yesterday before a competition. <laughs> Outside, when I was walking, Lizzie, so I put a sticker on the bottom of my shoe to cover the gum. Uh -huh. But you can also check out uh, my two sponsors. So if you go to dancestore.com, you can look at the Aris Allen shoe brand, which is amazing. Um, or go to dancerbrands.com if you're looking for like the suede boots and shoes. And with the coupon code DougSilfin15, you save 15%. All right, cool. All right, Doug, thanks, man. Yeah, man, thanks for having me.